So what I'd kind of like to start with is asking you what intrigued you about the brain to where you wanted to actually study it and make it sort of your life's work. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, it probably started with a, a philosophy of mind class I took back in college. Um, and, uh, you know, it's basically my, my favorite class in college. And, uh, you know, there are just these, these very profound questions about, uh, you know, mental phenomena, which which seem potentially disembodied, not physical, mm -hmm. and yet it just seems like they obviously have to arise in, in, in the brain. Uh, and so the, the fact that there's this, this connection between you know, the mind and the body, I just, I just found fascinating. So some um, of the big questions got yeah, you into the field. You know, what is the neural basis of consciousness? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, can we, uh, you know, is the brain different than a computer, right. you know? Uh, what is free will? I think I think those are some of the questions that really grab me. Those are good initially. questions. <laughs> the big yeah. questions are good questions. Yeah, and then um, so you know I started at kind of the lower end, uh, studying the retina, and then uh, you know it's been about twenty years now of studying the retina, and I feel like um, I understand that pretty well. <laughs> At least for me, you know, there, there are other things to, to know. Twenty but, years of studying uh, one organ. I mean, that's, yeah, it doesn't sound. I think uh, you're an expert in the field. For retina, okay. Uh, uh, you know, so now I'm I'm kind of uh, opening up the rest of the brain, and it's very exciting. Cool. Let me introduce you to our audience. Uh, thanks for watching Interview with a Neuroscientist. I'm Matt Taylor from Dementa, and we have in our, in our offices here Dr. Michael Berry from Princeton. He's a researcher and a professor at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. Right. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so happy to have you here today. Thanks, thanks for joining me and Great. for your time. And we're going to do Interview with a Neuroscientist. And I don't know, you, you don't know what I'm about to do, but this is what I do on Interview okay. with a Neuroscientist. I have four topics in okay. this, and okay. they're neuroscience topics. Cool. And we're gonna go through these, and uh, you get to pick which you want to talk about. So we'll just kind of go through the different topics, okay. and, I'll, and I'll show them off to you. The first one, complexity the light. complexity of light. Okay. For, yeah, for a thousand. Um, the birth of ideas. So this is going to be a, a deep one. There's a thought experiment in this one, All right. And that's for fifteen hundred. These are arbitrary. There's no money. This is not money. Sure. <laughs> Just for fun. Uh, how much is the IOU? Uh, there's a pun in there, but it's really bad. That's it's only five hundred. <laughs> and the last one. I hope this doesn't strike an optic nerve. Okay. Okay. So it's your choice between these four topics. Uh, which one do you want to start with? The complexity of life, the birth of ideas. Birth of ideas. I, I, how much is the IOU? Or and it's a, mm. who knows? Who knows which I, one? I guess I can start with that one. Okay. Okay. We're going to talk okay, the optic nerve. Then. That's mm -hmm. that's what I really wanted to get to is the optic nerve. And I happen to have a brain model here, okay. and this always falls apart when mm -hmm. we take it apart. But that's okay. Um, so here, here's the, the optic nerves, right, coming into the yeah. brain. So my main question is, I mean, this is a huge, there's a lot of yeah. information coming yeah. through those. Yeah. I mean, if you cut the optic nerve and, 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 I mean, and then freeze time, you're going to see, like, lots of nerve activations mm -hmm. coming yeah, through. Yeah, it's a little electrical pulses. So my, what I'm really curious about is where does the optic nerve go? Like, what parts of mm -hmm. the brain does it get routed through? Eventually, it gets to the cortex, and it gets representations get, are stored in the cortex yeah. of sensations that the retina is seeing. But where else does it go, and, and what happens to that signal? Yes, yeah, so the optic nerve um, goes to two primary places in, in the brain. Uh, it connects to the, uh, the thalamus. Mm -hmm. so the thalamus is the sensory gateway to the brain. So in particular, uh, the visual part of the thalamus. Um, and then where is the thalamus on there? It would be these footballs. These, fo these footballs. Okay. Yeah. This is old brain stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, and uh, from the thalamus, then it goes straight up into the primary visual cortex, which would be, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the back of the brain. Oh, yeah, okay. It kind uh, of to the back. How there is it goes. I got it. I got it. There we go. Yeah, the, the back. Uh, okay. The <clears throat> primary visual cortex. And what does the thalamus do to it? The signal that is is one of the great mysteries of neuroscience. It <laughs> oh. seems to do first question nothing. we hit on one of the great <laughs> mysteries of neuroscience. Great. Uh, so <laughs> the reason why this is this is a great mystery is that if you look at a neuron in the thalamus, okay, uh -huh. it gets input 
from the optic nerve, okay? But that constitutes about 5% of the synapses on that cell, mm. okay? In the thalamus? In the, in the thalamus, okay? okay? Uh, another 50% are feedbacks that come from the cortex. Oh, right. Okay, and another okay. I don't know, 45% are uh, brainstem uh, activating so it's doing synapses. The so feedback is some association for associating yeah, the signal I mean, with the context or something? Uh, well, we don't, we know. don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know. We don't know all that well. So the feedback, it seems like it's numerically 10 times stronger than the feed forward. Right. And yet, if you look at uh, what patterns of light cause that thalamic cell to fire, it seems to have a receptive field that's essentially identical to the the input optic nerve fiber. Hmm. So it seems like all that feedback did nothing. What? <laughs> uh, huh, so it why is it now. there? How, how could that be? Yeah. Um, and uh, there, there is some evidence that what that feedback does is uh, it uh, modulates the gain of the neuron a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, makes the, the activity a little bit stronger, maybe if you're expecting that that visual pattern right right um but it seems it seems uh like a surprisingly weak effect yeah, given that seems given all, all the circuitry does it have does the feedback have anything to do with motor controls or saccades or your eyes moving we we really don't know yeah. uh, the, the feedback is coming from the the deepest layer of, of the visual cortex mm -hmm. layer six and um people almost don't record from layer six so so we, we don't know that much about it interesting um, could, and could, and it's interesting that, that the theme is repeated, you know. So if you if you look at uh, the input from the thalamus into the primary visual cortex, mm -hmm. it's also a teeny tiny fraction of all the synapses in the visual cortex. In the visual cortex. So if you uh, because if, of feedback coming to it from exactly. other places, so it exactly. could be just a structure of the cortex. That's just what the cortex does. Yeah, but mm. but what is it doing with all that mm. all that feedback? Um, so this is we don't. This is an <laughs> important question. Let me see if I had a. Uh, that's what. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Was how yeah. much feedback to the retina is coming from the to the retina? Oh, even? to the retina. Yeah, um, through that optic that's nerve. that's a little different. Uh -huh. So uh, the retina gets relatively little feedback. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it's maybe five percent of all the fibers. Do we know why that even exists? Yeah, we 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 have some idea. Um, one of the feedbacks. Okay, so, so the, the optic nerve uh, branches to two main brain areas. Mm -hmm. I said the thalamus, the other is uh, it's called the superior colliculus, mm -hmm. okay, but it also branches to several, maybe 10 other minor brain centers. One of the minor brain centers, it's called the pretectal nucleus. Okay, and what that does is it controls your pupillary light reflex. This is not really a nucleus, right? This is like a idea. It's a blob of cells. Blob of cells. Yeah, <clears throat> that's the anatomical version of the word nucleus. Okay. Um, so you know, if you shine a really bright light, your your pupil contracts, mm -hmm. okay, and then that reduces the light intensity on your on your retina. So it kind of helps stabilize the amount of light falling on your retina. Right. And when it gets dark, it opens again. Right. Okay. So the this little pretectal nucleus makes the decisions to dilate or contract your your pupil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so. So that you know, that's encoded in uh, motor neurons that go to your eye, eye, so that, eye muscles. That's okay. actually coming from your brain. Not, the retina is not no. monitoring its own iris movements. That's right. Interesting. That's I brain. always assumed that it would do that. It's, yeah. it's a simple thing to do. It's just a threshold, I would assume. Right? But uh, yeah, uh, uh, okay. I mean, it's it, the brain. It, it's not simple. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it turns out there um, there are other influences on your pupil diameter. Kind of well, a sexual attraction, arousal, arousal. Yeah, arousal yeah, yeah. the whole whole other set of circuits yeah. that are not purely related to light. But yeah. so one of the things the pretectal nucleus does is it also feeds back to the retina. Mm. Okay, and that feedback is kind of a modulatory feedback. So the idea is the retina um, needs to adapt to the overall light level. Right. Okay, because if you have a thousand photons a second, you need to have one type of response. You have two photons a second. You know, different, uh, uh, stronger gain, let's say. Right. Okay, so the pretectal nucleus is about to change the light intensity on your retina. Mm -hmm. So you know it's going to change. So the pretectal nucleus has a feedback that helps the retina kind of pre-adapt ahead of time right. to give a knowledge that it's about to change the light level. I guess it's similar to the way you make your movements. You're, you know that your senses are going to adapt to as you're moving. Yeah. They're going to yeah. feel different. So this is this is kind of a automatic kind of built-in right. system. So that's uh, that's one example of a, of a feedback to the retina. 
Uh, the other one that's kind of crazy is from the olfactory bulb. Really? <laughs> so this has been seen in uh, goldfish. I'm not sure if it's true in human. Uh, but the idea is uh, in goldfish, uh, if you smell amino acids in the water, okay, it could be food. Mm -hmm. So the feedback to your retina causes uh, the retinal neurons to have more sensitivity for color mm -hmm. and spatial detail, less for, for temporal information. Interesting. And if the food goes away, <coughs> then maybe you want to be prepared for predators and it goes back to temporal sensitivity. That makes sense. I can see that happening in other species. Perhaps. So, you know, there's... there's um, there are a couple of these modulations of the retina, but they're they're relatively minor right. in, in, in the scale of things. So can I pick the next one? Sure. You mentioned photons. Yes. So <laughs> let's talk about yeah. the complexity of light. And I know that you okay. started in physics. Um, okay, yeah. The retina is amazing. So first of all, light just contains so much information. It's just um, it's hard to imagine how much information is hitting our retinas right that's, now. That's true, yeah. I, I always think of it like, what if I had a microscope or telescope lens that I could always zoom in around anywhere I'm looking? I mean, that's how much information, like electron microscope type of well, detail. Well, right? that's what your eyes always doing. And you're controlling your lens. Yeah, you're, but you're we don't have, but it's not just a camera. I mean, you, we, when you go to grade school, they teach mm -hmm. you, oh, your retina is like a camera, but no, it's so, so, so much more Definitely. than just a camera. Definitely. So I guess, one of the, how does the retina mm -hmm. even make sense of all those photons? What are the basic mechanisms it uses to encode information in, in those photons? Yeah, I mean, so um, one of the hardest uh, jobs that the retina handles is that the amount of photons striking it varies so much uh, during the course of the day. You know, so if you, if you ask, like, what is the photon arrival rate at noon versus midnight? Be different Huge. by a factor of a billion or ten billion. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. so it or even means, just inst moment to moment, right? And yeah, I mean, going, walking from a dark room into a light yeah, room it changes by a factor of a thousand, yeah. and, and you hardly notice. Um, so the retina has to adapt tremendously. Okay, you know, when it's really dark, um, your your retina needs to be able to uh, detect individual photons, mm -hmm. which is which is kind of incredible, and yeah. it's, it's really good at it. Yeah, um, and so. There's, uh, it, it's actually very well known how uh, biochemicals in the photoreceptor cells uh, do that. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea is the photon strikes one molecule and changes its shape. Okay, then that molecule uh, moves around and it triggers reactions in a thousand secondary molecules. And those each trigger reactions in hundreds of... Within uh, retina cells. Within, e with, within, within each, each cell. photoreceptor cell. Mm -hmm. So the one photon ends up changing, you know, the activation of thousands of molecules. Wow! You know, by by this amplification yeah. uh, procedure. So, so you know that that's how you can detect individual photons. Um, but then the same cell, you know, if it's getting, you know, tens of thousands of photons a second uh, in in the daytime, it needs to have only an itty bitty response to each photon. Otherwise, it'd be overwhelmed. Yeah. So it has uh, feedback mechanisms that kind of turn down the, the gain by, you know, can change by a factor of 100,000 in a uh, you know, fraction of a second. So the idea being, if, you've, if the eye really was a camera in some way, and it just yeah. f passed all, everything mm -hmm. on, the brain would just be overwhelmed with yeah. the, I mean, it'd be, it wouldn't be normalized in any way. It would just be Exactly. Chaos. I mean, if, if you take your actual video camera and you, like, look at the sky, uh -huh. it's all washed out. Yeah. Right. Right. If you do that with your eye, it looks fine. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and that's because your your uh, video camera has an overall gain control for the entire screen. Right. Okay. But your your retina has a gain control for each pixel. Yeah. For each cell. Everywhere you, know, you, you might look. That, that has yeah. has its own gain control that changes yeah. by actually much more than the, the video camera can change right. the gain. So you know, the retina is uh, really amazing compared to video camera. Um, I tried to like cross reference like what is, what would be the screen resolution of the eye like how what is the resolution that we're oh, seeing? It's at? not that much actually. Really? That's that's the crazy thing. Um, so the retina has uh, about one million ganglion cells, which are the output neurons. Uh -huh. Okay, and a uh, current video camera has you know more, um, but but it's what it does with it, right? Yeah. So so I mean the uh, the secret about how you use your visual system is that. You move your eyes around, right. so the very center of gaze, you have a high cell density right. that's let's say as good or better than any video camera. Mm -hmm. um, and the periphery, it's uh, it's much lower density, 
So you get kind of the gist of the image in the periphery and you see the fine details in the center. Mm -hmm. And then you move your eyes to new locations to get the information that you need about those locations and then your brain kind of stores that all together. And kind of fills it in. Fills it things in. Things it doesn't have details about. Yeah, so you see the whole world at high resolution. Right. Even though moment to moment you're only getting high resolution from a tiny little piece of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. Which is, you know, but our brain kind of pieces everything together smoothly so you don't notice that. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, let's go to the name. I'll just pick one. Let's okay. just pick one. Okay. okay, so we'll do how much is the eye you. And this okay. is really about, this is, should have been in an eye. This is uh, this was okay. a form. Anyway, how much work, and I think we we sort of just talked about this, because I, I wanted to know, cross-reference, how much work is happening in the retina versus happening in the brain, and we've already sort of alluded to this. Oh my god, I mean, so much is happening in the retina, but, but orders of magnitude more in the brain. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe... I don't know if you've studied the cochlea at all, but is would you say the retina is a lot more complex than our other senses? Uh, yeah, it's a lot more complex than the cochlea. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, actually, the auditory pathway has more processing before you reach the cortex than the visual system. Just have more steps of processing. More, more steps. Yeah. Right. Uh, so basically, your visual cortex is really huge. Mm -hmm. Auditory cortex is is a lot smaller. Um, yeah, so visual cortex is almost a third of the of the human brain. So you're using a huge amount of your whole brain, you know, bandwidth. Well, it's on, light. On visual I mean, processing. sound sound just doesn't have as much information yeah. as light. And light has way, way, way more. So I can see why that's the case. It's got to be more complex. Yeah. The, the environment's more complex, right? So I guess this is sort of a good topic since we already covered it. Okay, the birth of ideas. So the, <laughs> so this is a, let's do a thought experiment. Okay. And, and um, so let's pretend we have a box, a black box with a hole in it. You can't look at it, but you just look at, you just reach in and you feel something. And, you, you, and, and I'd like you to kind of maybe go over what's happening in your senses and in your brain as this happens. You're, you move your hand into the box, you touch something, you feel something fuzzy or furry, you know. So immediately these neurons in your hand are sending signals yeah. up your spinal cord to your brain and it's like furry, furry. You know, there's yeah. some some neurons in there are like the, like the furry neurons are being turned yeah. on, right? So you're trying to classify that sensation somehow. Mm -hmm. But that's all you have. Like you can't narrow it down at that point. Um, does that make sense? Or is that the barking up the right tree? Well, I mean, uh, it, it's really important that you can move your hand around. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so uh, so so kind of exercise I sometimes do with my students is, um, you know, I'll have a student like come up in front of the class, close their eyes, you know, hold up their hand. I'll put an object on on their fingers, right, like a peanut or something. And I have no idea. And ask what is, what what is it? And I have no idea. And yeah. then with their eyes still closed, I say, you know, feel it. Yeah. Like, oh, it's a peanut. Right. Right. You know, so um, your your sense of touch is is a very very active sense. Yeah. And um, you know, roughly the, the way we we think things go, and this is you know closely related to kind of work that Numenta does, is that you know your brain um, kind of every moment it's it's making a prediction uh, of what you're you're going to feel on the tips of your fingers, you know, it, as you move your finger, you know, over the object. Mm -hmm. um, so you you take in the sensory data in the first moment. Kind of activates some representation of possible objects. Like maybe every furry thing I've ever yeah, touched. Yeah, a whole set of furry things. Maybe think of a teddy bear or sure. something. So that feeds back a prediction as you move a little bit more. What yeah. should you feel if it were a teddy bear? Okay, mm -hmm. let's say it isn't exactly like that. Right. You know, then uh, that's new information. You update the prediction. Or it, or it moves. And then you're like, well, you know, okay. It's not a teddy bear. It's not a teddy bear. Maybe it's a bear. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, a dog moves different than a cat. You know, yeah. might feel a cat's shoulder up against your hand. And you're like, okay, that's a cat. Yeah. Then you remove the box and you're like, that's my cat. <laughs> you know? I mean, you're narrowing yeah. it down yeah. all the time, you know, and then yeah. suddenly you're like, your, your neurons that associate with your cat in particular, those are the ones that exactly. are now. You yeah. have the idea of your cat in your brain. And that that's longer that's longer lasting than the sensations of the furriness that you first oh, felt, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. that's something that you can hold in your in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's an idea. Uh, well, I've run out of cards. Is there anything you'd like to talk about before we disengage um, the interview? 
Well, uh, so, so I guess, you know, uh, like one other thing about the visual system that, that I think is, is really uh, pretty fascinating. Um, I mean, you know, vision works so well for us. We just look at a face and we, oh, we know who that person is. Yeah. It seems effortless. We have no idea of like what the neurons are doing, but there's so much computation going on underneath the hood. Uh, and one example of that uh, that I like is the fact that you know your eyes are always moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have, if you consider the neurons in your in your retina, okay, uh, when you move your eyes, um, they look at each neuron looks at a different spot in in the visual world, and the neuron fires just completely differently. Oh right, yeah, it gets a different picture every yeah. moment. Every time you you know, so with for the retina, whenever you move your eyes, the visual goes at high speed and lands on something new. Yeah. Okay, uh, and yet we don't see any of that. You know, so so what it means is uh, is that our, our sort of whole visual brain is kind of taking the information from the retina in every moment and kind of remapping it to the right spatial location. Right. To kind of it's incorporating yeah, it's the motor command spatial shifts that yeah. are correct for your your eye movements. You're always bringing mm -hmm. the same information together in the right place, mm -hmm. and we just have have no sense that we're even moving our eyes. Yeah, or our heads or our arms. Yeah, are, you know. even though uh, we, we always are. So we kind of create this uh, this kind of invariance in, in the world, even though it's it's not very closely related to the primary sensory cells and what they're doing. But I guess it's it's our model of the world that we've been creating for years and years and yeah. years, and yeah. it makes sense to us. So. <laughs> Exactly. So. That's why when when uh, when we're babies, none of our actions make any sense at all. It yeah. seems like they're just random. You're just bumping into things, mm -hmm. looking around. But over time, you learn and you learn and you learn, and those associations start coming up until you have control over your mm -hmm. actions and and you're interacting with things with purpose all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Barry, thank you okay. for taking the time to have this with me. I really appreciate it, and thanks you all for watching interview with the neuroscientist. I've been Matt Taylor with the Mental.